Here's part two of our conversation with former Boston drummer Jim Mastia. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. Now remember, this is Jim's point of view on what happened in making the first Boston album. He came back for third stage. Tom Scholz is more than welcome to communicate with us and tell us his side of the story as well. Because the, the consensus in the rock and roll world is this was Tom's project, mostly Tom's project. Jim has a different view. Here's part two of our conversation with Jim Mastia. What did those conversations sound like? You must have obviously confronted Tom and talked to him about this. Again, it, initially, when the album came out, I always felt that somehow he was going to do the right thing and he would have to come back to me because we wrote the music together. I always believed that. And I w- kind of waited and waited. Even at one point in like 78, when the second album came out and I still hadn't gotten anything. And I'm like, what's going on? I talked to an attorney and he said, I have to sue him. And I, I didn't want to sue him because I felt if I sue him, I'm burning a bridge and I'm Boston too. I mean, that's, we need to work this out. So it, it just, you know, I, and again, I'm young. Tom's five years older than me. So I was, when we started playing, I was like 17. So when it hit, I was 22, but I had no attorneys. I had no legal counsel. My father was dead. My mother didn't get out of the 10th grade. So I, I really didn't know what was happening. I just, again, you don't realize, you know, I didn't know it was the greatest selling album in the history of music. You know, so, and, but even if I did, because of the flaw in publishing, there was nothing I could do. There was no way to enforce, except if I had sued him because I had the contract. But I was stupid enough to not push it, thinking it would work out. And then I waited too long and statute of limitations, and then you're screwed. So for me. But you came it, back. You came back for a third stage. Correct. And that was because in 1980, Tom told all the other band members, Barry, Francis, that they were going to, he knew the lawsuit was happening with CBS, so there was going to be a whole some time that they could go ahead and do own, their own projects if they wanted. So I caught wind of that somehow, and I contacted Barry because I was working at a pro audio place. So I called Tad Barry. I said, I can build your demo studio so you can start working on your record. And I... Myself and a friend of mine, Bruce Arnold. Bruce is the brother of, uh, I'm sorry, Les Arnold. He's the brother of Bruce Arnold from Orpheus. So Les and I built Barry's studio in his home. Then once we were done, I was the drummer on his project. Barry and I were now starting to write his songs. The first day I had studio finished, I said, okay, Barry, play me your stuff. What do you got? He goes, what do you mean, what do I got? I said, your tunes, the stuff you've written, what you want to work on? I said, I've never written anything. I said, what do you mean? He goes, nah, I, I've come up with a couple of guitar licks over the years, but I had never really, which was true because he was a cover player. He, he was just out there doing covers. That's what he liked to do. So we started working and we spent a few weeks working on it. Tom caught wind of it. And when he caught wind of it, he realized, even though he's a narcissist and believes that I had no effect on the music, he knew his subconscious knew different. Because he didn't want me working with Barry because Brad was singing it. Brad had agreed to do the vocals. Barry and me, we were going to be the band. Barry was going to do his own bass. And Tom found out and called me up, asked me to come back. Because he felt that Tom, him, Brad, and I were the creative force. He was lying. He just didn't want me working with Barry. So he brought me back into the band. And now we're working on the third album. Uh, he pushed he so pushed Sib out. He didn't want to work with Sib. He told me when he called me that he couldn't work with Sib. It was too hard. He wanted to work with me like he had done. On yeah, but the Sib's other... on a half the album, isn't he? Is he not? Hungry? Yeah, Sib, the, Sib and, our, and Tom lied to me because Sib continued to work. Even after I was working with him and I was told that I was now it was me, Tom and Brad and you know all this stuff he had told me. It turns out Sib was still working for another year or two because again, and that makes perfect sense. Those are Sib's songs again. Uh, the first side, pretty much half of it, a little bit more, a sieve. Then uh, the launch, uh, 
des my destination I'm playing. I played with Tom on. And then the second side, that's pretty much all me. But the whole album, I'm playing all the cymbals because when Sid had done his tracks, Sid hits his bass pedal. Okay. When he goes to crash at the end of the field, blah, 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 when he crashes, he hits the cymbal first by fractions of milliseconds. Then he hits the kick drum. When I play it, I hit the kick drum first and I'm a little, lag, a little behind with the crash cymbal. Now, you might not think it matters, but it does because back then, Tom was in the studio, the compressor was triggered by the kick drum. So when he crashed the cymbal first, the cymbal was already ringing, going into the microphones. Then he hits the kick and it causes the compressor to clamp down and it causes a glitch in the sound of the cymbals, an audible problem. He didn't know it until, you know, he finally started, I guess, doing mixes of those songs. He did, so for years, he didn't realize it. Then when he heard it, so I had to replay all the cymbals on every song. So my songs, it wasn't a problem, but all those songs that Civet played, I'm playing all the cymbals. You toured that, you toured, so that, that would explain why you toured Third Stage. Yes, I was supposed to be the, again, Tom, Brad, and I were supposed to be the band now and leading up to the tour for the third album, but the lawsuit happened. So that stretched it out for six years. So instead of 1981, 82, us out touring and the album is out, it was held up for four years with the lawsuit. So finally, when it did happen, we started the tour and uh, yes, I was a part of it, but Tom had already decided he didn't want me anymore. He wanted to get rid of me. So he brought in Doug Hoffman to play third stage. So I would open the shows. I would open rock and roll band and then whether a couple of the boss, the original tunes, then, then Doug would come out and stop playing. Then they would do all of third stage, all at one shot. Then for the encores, I would come out and do another couple of the original tunes. And then Doug got to finish. They did like, uh, he don't, don't look back for the finale, whatever. And so, but Tom had decided he didn't want me in the band and he systematically began to eliminate me. At the Texas Jam, there's pictures, every, all these different promotion pictures. You can't see me, but Tom has his work. As everybody, He's eliminating. He has Doug in the pictures because Doug is now the drummer of Boston in Tom's mind. He's going to replace me with Doug. So he's making sure all the pro everything looks it's Doug. It, there's an out, there's a, a poster with Ludwig. It was 1985, I think it was the drummer and roadie poster. I'll send you the copy of it. And it's with Yes, Pink Floyd, uh, Super Tramp, uh, you know, all these major groups. And we go out to L.A. to shoot it. I'm an endorser for Ludwig because the third album's coming. So it's also I got to try my, this drum set behind you. That's my endorser set from the third tour. And so I go out to do the shoot and Doug comes because he's in the band now with us. Yeah. So all of a sudden, we're there the first day and Gary Peel had come. And then Gary comes over to us, you know, Jim, um, Tom called. Uh, we don't want you in the picture. We just want Doug. And I looked at Bar Gary and I said, what the f are you talking about? First of all, I wrote the music. Doug is a cover drummer who's copying my, my parts. And you're going to put him in the Ludwig photo showing these famous drummers from these other famous bands, Mark White at the time for Yes, you know, and the other Alan guy. White. Uh Alan yeah, White. Alan White, yeah. So you're going to put somebody who had nothing to do with the writing of that music and say he's the drummer of Boston. I mean, Sid should have been there more than Doug. I've often wanted to Photoshop Sid, in, take Doug out and put Sid in because Sid has, has an impact on the band. Is the third, second album and into the third, Sid is, has an influence. He's a part, he's part of the band. Doug's not, Doug's a nice guy, but he had nothing to do with Boston. But yet, Tom was using Gary and JD, the manager who used to be uh, Sammy Hagar's manager that Tom took and became his 
his worker, Tom, basically used Dave to do his dirty work. So they basically, and again, these are pictures of, I have the picture upstairs, there's a poster from the, from the Texas Jam in 1987. We are the headliner, Aerosmith's our opening act, Poison, White Snake. We're the headliners. This poster, you can barely see, almost not present. We'll have more from Jim Mastia coming up in a few days. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. If you want to make a donation to the channel, there's a link in the description. If you want to buy a t-shirt, there's a link down there as well. This is Rocky Stream Music. Take care of yourself.